worked in water, she's worked in, on a local scale and a global scale. There's a lot of sculptural work, uh, part time lecture in DIT in the Fine Arts Department. And she's going to talk to us today about her past and present. Thank you. So, yeah, Anne McLeod, and I will actually live in Leitrim, so I sort of traverse between Leitrim and Dublin for a So, what I want to do today is just give an overview of some of the projects that I've been doing that are, that are both local, national, and global, uh, and uh, just to talk a little bit about some of the projects I've done and where my practice lies, and then a little bit about a research project that I'm doing that involves the River Shannon. So, my practice is primarily concerned with them. Um, landscape studies and investigation of competing sets of values based on the resources of the land. I think that water is really um, uh, quite controversially can be seen as a resource as a lot of economies associated with water as well. And I'm currently working on a series of long-term research exhibition projects that examine the property exhibitions, cultures and practices around water, you know, as I said, both locally and globally. So, I have an overall title for a series of projects, and that's like water conversations. Um, so I use a kind of strategy of um, engaging with people through small objects and sculptures, engaging with people on subjects of water. I try and um, set a framework around the sculpture, uh, but often the conversations migrate across all different areas of the water and the sort of local conditions that are there. Um, so I'm just trying to tease out the commonalities across um, our experience of water across different um, uh, locations in the world. I think, you know, a lot of the issues that are really around, you know, our consumption, we're all consumers, um, consumers of water, and at different levels we feel guilty about our relationship with water. Um, and I think that one of the things that this project, this series of projects is trying to do, is to try and seek out commonalities. Uh, I'm also interested in the idea of, you know, how what inseparable human and natural processes are. So it's the natural processes of the land, but it's also our human engagement. Landscape is, is not neutral, and that landscape is completely um, um, designed by humans. So there's no area practically left in the globe that has not been touched by, by human agencies. So I'm interested in these kind of ideas. I'm also interested in the idea of water as a commons and in the complex you know, rituals associated with it. So just to move on to the first, one of the first projects that I did um, in a global context was the water conversations. Uh, this, this piece is called Water Spot. And uh, I was in a symposium in uh, Kumasi in Ghana in, in West Africa. And um, it was a symposium looking at you know, um, the uh, local resources and um, how art can uh, mediate some of the uh, ideas around local resources. And some of the participating artists were asked to uh, build a, a kiosk using kind of local vernacular uh, and um, conduct some transnational uh, discourse. Um, so I decided that I would look at water and see what the, what were, what were the local issues around water in Ghana. It, uh, you know, it's interesting because you know access to water is very difficult in Ghana and uh, it's quite privatised. And there's an increasing amount of privatisation around water. So depending on your economic you know, um, status, it, it, access to water is be quite limited. So generally, the poorest people pay more for water. And, uh, that might be a global situation. And so um, I brought the kiosk to different sites. One was in the university grounds, where the symposium was happening. And of course, the conversations there tended to be much more about the taboos around, um, around water with the local, uh, in, um, sort of local, local, I suppose, uh, Mythologies, and uh, when I brought it to a village, then the discourse was very much around um, uh, the privatisation of water and the difficulty and the expense of water. Um, uh, this is I'm talking to William, who is a uh, William a Jew, uh, who lived in this house here, and uh, he said he was really disappointed because when Ghana uh, got independence, one of the promises that Nkrumah made to people was that you know, all the resources of the land would be made free to the people from the citizens of Ghana. And uh, unfortunately, he felt this erosion of values was the, uh, the, the values of independence of being created. This, uh, oops, jumped.
Okay, this project uh, is a project I did with a collaborative partner, Carol Hummel, who's an American artist in the US, uh, from Ohio. And uh, we were in northern India on a project, and we decided to collaborate on um, having a look at uh, how an image, a simple image of uh, water preservation would operate across diverse communities. Um, so we went to nine locations in northern India, um, from east to west, up to Kashmir, and back down again. And uh, we engaged with conversations around um, and water with, with, the, with the poster. And the poster was, um, uh, I suppose, based on, I've been seeing, do you remember the, when we had this, the really freeze up in Ireland and uh, we got run out, out of water in Dublin? And uh, I was interested in um, those conserve water messages up on the LED screens all the way into Dublin um, during that period as the water began to run out. And I was wondering, you know, they had, they had a, a sign with them. Um, Dripping tap and then a cross stitch. So I was wondering how that would um, translate into different communities. And of course, the, the people are really um, are very aware of the global um, problem of culture and how finite it is wherever we went. Um, this is another project that I did in India, which was looking at the spiritual relationships um, that people have with water, the rituals, the practices around water. Um, and this is in the site um, Ogaya. Ogaya is um, Pilgrim is site for Buddhists all over the world who come to Bogai because it's the site where uh, Buddha put enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. And uh, at any one time, there, like many cities in India, there tend to be a number of festivals going on at once. You know, so you'll have Buddhist festivals, Hindu festivals, Muslim festivals, all sort of a cacophony of festivals going on. And generally, they involve water. So I was interested in talking to people about, you know, what were the um, commonalities around water. And of course, one of them is, you know, water as a symbol of purity. And uh, I like this image because I went out on the street with the sculpture and uh, with the translator um, assistant. And uh, I like this image because it's you know, Hindu talking to a Muslim a Buddhist about water. And it's, it's um, this is a project from uh, the Samuel Mountains in Southern, Southern California. I was on an interdisciplinary um, project where we were looking at possible uses of deceased um, silver mine. Um, as you're probably aware, Silver mining or mining in general is very um, polluting activity. And uh, in Hinsdale County, where a lot of gold and silver mines are, um, well, they're, they're sort of, well, some of them are still operating, and a lot of them are, um, a lot of them are depleted. But the point is that uh, mining can leave acid mine drainage into water bodies for decades after they've finished operating. So um, I made this parasol. Shamanistic um, motive, and uh, I walked around the different, um, the different um, parts of Lake City that I suppose have benefited most from the mining industry. Um, the bank, as I call it, the SLS. It's a kind of a bit different to walk. So I'm interested in um, the idea of viewing water bodies as boundaries between human and spirit worlds. I think um, water can be a metaphoric bridge between between the kind of physical world that we live in and the psychological world. Um, the physical world being, you know, negotiating, looking at um, a physical site. For example, this is the Shannon Pot, which, you know, has a very deep um, mythological um, resonances to it, uh, as the, you know, traditionally seen as the, uh, as the start of the Shannon River. Of course, we know now that many tributaries flow into, into the Shannon to create the massive river that it is by the time it gets to, uh, by the time it gets to Limerick, but uh, it's, Interesting when you go to visit it, it really is quite a strange place because all these different tributaries feed in underground. It's only in the Quinta Mountains, so they go in, the rivers and tributaries go underground, and then they bubble up at this point of the, um, the Shannon Park. So, apart from its mythological history, it also has a very, very strange sort of, um, experience when you're there. You know, you just see the water bubbling up, and it's only 19 meters across, but it's nine meters deep, so it's it's I think that's part of its mystique. So I live very near here. So I'm at the top of the Shannon and you're all down at the end of the Shannon. Um, so this is a project that I did um, on the banks of the Shannon, Carrick and Shannon. There was a number of artists in 2007 who began a research project where we were looking at um, the institu uh, institutional failure of, uh, of the planning laws and how this was affecting them. Um, 
urban and rural landscapes, particularly the sort of suburbia that was growing up around Carrick Town at the time. Um, I don't know whether you know, but Leitrim suffered from some of the worst excesses of the world. And uh, we have, I think, the most um, dense population of ghost estates now that are in this situation. Um, but in 2007, we as a group of artists were quite you know, exercised by this, and we, was, we thought this kind of gentrification of the landscape was happening, and it was, it was changing the character of the villages and towns around um, you know, what had been quite an unscaled part of the county in Ireland. You know? um, so we were worried about, you know, each of us, through our own research, came to an area where we thought was most important to us. And this is, um, I came to the idea of water and how building on floodplains is probably a very bad idea, but also the, uh, what was happening to the effluent that was going into the um, rivers and lakes from septic tanks, etc. Because, of course, these discrete um, housing estates so already have a, a, an integrated uh, waste disposal system. So I was thinking that really, you know, and this was just, in fact, the year I started the research was um, when that disaster happened in Montgomery. Now that was um, definitely traced back to, although the Galway City Council tried to blame um, tried to blame farming as as uh, one of the pollutants, and I'm sure it was, because of washing and, and all these go over to rivers and create the problems that we're trying to deal with. So um, I thought that I would posit um, an alternative system into the public space and um, try and get some sort of critical mass around discussing how um, now, there are alternative systems to the systems we currently have, which are obviously um, such a disaster in terms of infrastructural failure. Um, we, we pump a lot of chemicals into the water to make it portable. We, we enjoy in Ireland some of the highest rainfall around the world, you know, but we, we really should not have a problem with water, but we do seem to um, mismanage it so dreadfully. So uh, I made this rain capture, so the rain is caught in the canopy, goes down into the tank, and when you press a button for the water, it gets pushed through um, through the filter system, and it's irradiated by UV light, um, and you can know, drink the water. So I was trying to make the point where we have, we actually, the water that rains down upon us, apart from the newly being to filtered out um, through some filters, really is very clean, and doesn't need all the um, chemicals that we Use. And I used solar power as a way of making a sustainable and a local solution. So I'm currently working on a project. Yeah. Currently working on a project, which is a research project. Um, I'm working with a group of artists and curators who we're doing a project called Troubling Ireland, and we're looking at um, I suppose some of the, trying to unpack some of the crises that have happened in Ireland, economic crises, but other crises that have happened, well, the, the ongoing crisis of the border, you know, and uh, so we're looking at different ways of troubling Ireland, and I've chosen to look again, because my practice is around, practices around discourses around water, I decided to look at the economies of water um, and the generation of energy, that's two kind of interlinked ideas. And um, so that brought me to look at the Arby Prussia power station. And I was really interested in, you know, in the time of crisis when it was conceived and built between 1925 and 29. Um, Ireland was, was on the brink of bankruptcy. It was a real crisis. Um, it was a psychological crisis post Civil War. And um, the government at the time took a really brave decision to put um, 5.2 million, which was um, 25% of the national budget into this speculative project because there were many uh, people who thought that this would not work. So I was interested in this idea of being really, uh, I suppose, uh, brave about new technology and using technology to, um, to generate, to turn the lights on in Ireland because of course Ireland at that time had no electric, uh, electricity except for some very local schemes. Electricity was expensive. So this was a, I thought, a very brave move by the government and I thought maybe it would have some resonances today and that maybe the government could be more innovative in how they use what funds we do have towards looking at alternative energy sources rather than the uh, ones that we have polluting. So not only did this bravery around you know how to generate or how to use water to generate electricity and um, to use such a large portion of the national budget, but also um, 
because the building itself became a very iconic project. So I just wanted to <coughs> show you this poster, which I think, you know, the language of the poster, I'm very interested in how language is used when, when, um, uh, when looking at, uh, I suppose, um, when looking at you know, the building of cultural icons. Um, and I'll just read, <coughs> read you out a little bit of the text because uh, I think it's really uh, fascinating use of language. So it says 90,000 horsepower of energy would be available from the Shannon Electrical Power Station next year for Irish industry and Irish homes. The American workman is the most prosperous on Earth because he has, on average, three horsepower, the equivalent of 30 human slaves helping him to produce. No wonder he can toil less and be paid more than the workman in other lands. So it goes on in such language. And ends with, which I think is really the most sort of, um, technological optimism that, that I suppose that was the current at the time in the early 20th part of the 20th century. Shannon, electricity will lift the heavy work of industry from human shoulders to the iron shoulders of machines. Thank you. 